I still love making videos. And that is sort of a hard statement to say out loud. Alexandra Miroslav is not even close to like technically perfect. But this last injury was the first breaking point I think I've ever experienced. Welcome to another episode of the That's Not Real Climbing podcast. I'm your host, Ginny, and I'm excited to introduce my guest for today, Albert Oak. You may have seen Albert's old viral YouTube videos where he does deep dive analyses into great comp climbing beta break moments. Nowadays, he's spending more time as a speed climbing coach, as well as working on his own training. In this episode, we'll talk about his beta break series, what it's like coaching at the World Cup, trying to make Team USA, and his slew of injuries. Of course, he also geeks out plenty when it comes to the technical aspects of speed climbing, which is a treat to listen to. Enjoy this conversation with Albert. Okay. How are you on this fine holiday? I uh, definitely just had an uh, explosion session. Uh, I, I, that's kind of what I call whenever I go full tilt mode. I take 400 milligrams of caffeine and I just go until like all my fingers are exploded and I try really hard. And then usually it, nothing actually productive happens, but I get to feel good about myself. Kind of. Not really. Okay. So was it a good session or no? <laughs> I can't tell. There was like very significant glimpses of hope where it's like, okay, if I am calm, cool, and collected, it will definitely be successful on my next speed run. But today was not that day. <laughs> okay. So yeah. not the best session. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a six out of 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah. But I had fun. I had fun. I always, I always do have fun. Just different variations of fun question mark <laughs> yeah are you feeling like up to 100 percent? Mm, definitely not like uh after sessions i can definitely feel my elbow like throbbing for a bit and then i kind of have to ice pack it or just stop climbing for a second but by the time i sleep and wake up it usually is okay take some of my favorite advil <laughs> right yeah yeah I thought you, well, I guess I was referring to, I guess, how you feel really tired lately. I mean, we'll get into that later as well, but mm. yeah. Are uh, you still feeling tired? I may or may not have just woken up right before this <laughs> for, for for like a 20 minute crash nap and, and now I feel a lot better. So Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great. Well, I'm really excited to get into this interview. Um, I found you on YouTube a while ago. Um, which we'll also talk about in a bit. But yeah, I'm sure you've been following climbing competitions for a while. So when did you start getting into watching climbing competitions and what uh, drew you to them? It's interesting. So injuries was kind of the greatest and best, like worst thing that ever happened to me. One of the biggest things that I always tell people whenever they talk, ask me for advice on injuries is I was like, you can always train regardless of your situation and like that goes beyond climbing and so i had ruptured my shoulder extremely bad i tore everything inside it and i had nothing else to do and i couldn't climb i couldn't do a pull-up i mean i could walk sure whatever but even that was a little bit difficult so what was the next best thing i could do i went through every single world cup possible I went from, like, I look for footage from, like, 1980s, like, VHS oh, wow. footage from, like, the Snowbird uh, World Climbing Championship, and, like, I just studied everything. And then after a certain point, I think around when I got to 2012, I would start pausing the video before they climb, read the climb, assume mm -hmm. how they're going to climb it as per the athlete once I, like, sort of got the repertoire, mm -hmm. and then I would play it. And, like, that's how I spent my time. Yeah. And this was what... 2017 2018 so like mm -hmm. not too long ago but long enough ago where yeah that's crazy that's really far back <laughs> what were those old competitions like i have not gone back into the archives that far i think if you are an extreme uh enthusiast for competition climbing it's worth looking at how the style changed and sort of like making inferences of why styles changed some of the things that's so simple is like when you look at 1980s um, climbing, 
nobody could really toe hook nobody could heel hook why because they're using shoes that are laces right and like they don't have like a heel cup now now you have the s cup re- rand or the p3 heel system i'm like i don't even know like it gets like an, it, outrageous these days but like yeah they, they wouldn't heel hook that much or toe hook that much you don't see that so it's like oh maybe they all the style changed because like technology also changed or like ability started changing and that's when you start seeing like the progression and think about why it changed between all this dynamic style, which is kind of entertaining to think about and like hy- hypothesize and especially the athletes. So like uh, it, it, in the background, Kim Jain, she's been around for everything. You can see how she adapted to all the changes and still was able to stay on top. And it, it's, I think that's more impressive than any of the other things I've seen. Yeah. When did she start climbing? <sighs> wow. She's been competing for like what? probably like what 15 to 18 years like she was like doing youth comps at, i guess when she was what 12 13 probably yeah obviously there's no footage of that but like you can see her in 2012 versus 2022 it's like whoa she her her style hasn't seriously changed but like it's adapted and it's like yeah she still is like elegant lock off graceful whatever but she can like throw herself now when she needs to especially in this recent world champ you can see her adapt- adaptation. I mean, I'm really surprised she came back. I had no idea that, that was going to happen. So that was pretty crazy to see. Yeah. She's kind of just like, got to be everyone's hero, right? Like there's yeah. no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. For everyone. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, is there like a, I mean, would you say that competition climbing has gotten better over the years? Hopefully. Mm. I think it's, it's been like following the trends that it should i think yeah you get some experimental moments where like myringen i love myringen that is by far always my favorite comp i'm kind of sad that it wasn't was it it was gone this year right uh am i crazy i'm not certain it feels so long ago now but i know yeah wait what yeah in what way is it experimental they always showcase something unique where like they had the hand jam, they had the paddle in finals. They always do something like crazy or like the 180 turnouts and they always love like testing something new and a new concept. Um, it's, I, I mean, I guess 2023, the trend is, all right, you're on a slab, you like 180 and then you reach out, which I, which I love like that you get to see experimental changes like that. In the beginning, I think there was just so much latching on to what, outdoor climbing is so yeah like for like probably from 1980 until what 2000 you you saw like just static climbing it was very like static don't cut your feet if you have to it's just to reset your feet and that's it but now like i feel like the setting and the styles of changing for competition climbing has sort of allowed athletes to explore different skill sets that they would otherwise have never need to and it's like cooler i i I love it i love the change i love change i i think there's like room for change always so um as long as it's in a positive way so okay awesome do you think um it was kind of like harder to watch uh the older competitions because they don't have as like flashy holds or like big macros and stuff like that almost the opposite surprisingly right because like you you kind of know exactly what holds they're going to go to. It's like, okay, is it a sloper or is it a crimp? And there's like, that's it. Or maybe it's a pinch. And so you don't have like much variation in the holds and like, oh, what's the purchase angle of this? So, oh, you now you get to see how the climber uses a hold. Where nowadays, uh, like a huge macro hold, a single climber can manipulate it in a way that is completely different than everyone else. Um, notably, let's say Tomo Narasaki on that uh, bolt, men's boulder one in the recent world championship combined final, he like was like meat wrapping and he like pressed into the finish. Whereas Jakob, you saw him like stand into it completely differently. And so there's a lot more variance in how people even just use a single hold these days with these bigger holds. And back then it was like, oh, now you get to see what muscles they're using, what how they're holding things. It's like very like. Uh, if, if you, you have like a static uh, object and then you have a dynamic f- field of athletes, uh, wow, I just 
went full computer science nerd there. But uh, yeah, and so you get to see the the variation between every athlete rather so much than just like the whole types and how they're manipulating. But then you got to like look at the flip side where because they can manipulate holds, you see who's like so really smart and really creative and at finding positions today. So it, it, it's kind of cool. Um, especially you back then, you got to see like which female climbers were just like, just jacked could one arm pull up on a crimp versus not mm. well i mean a lot of them can do it now i think yeah I, mean, I think all of them can do it now it's like kind of ridiculous yeah but then okay so given like these new holds and like new ways of doing it that kind of leads into your whole beta brain series yes <laughs> if you want to talk about how you got into that and so Basically, I'm sitting here. I, I barely can use my arm. I, I'm like watching every single comp and almost every single comp. There's always just like one athlete that does something just super unique. And the rules were a little more laissez-faire back then because they didn't know. So like you could grab bolts, you could like put your finger in certain like screw holds and black tape was like poorly designed sometimes. And so you always find the cheeky climber. It's like, you know what? I can do that. I can cheat the climb. And they, they find the, a beautiful solution where it's like, yeah, actually, if you if a, lame, a layman saw the climb, of course, that's the most obvious solution. It's like, why not just use the hole over there? I'm like, oh, okay, but everyone thought it was off. But then it wasn't. And so then they get to use it and get away with it. And so I made this video and uh, I sat on the video for almost a year and a half. And a lot of people kind of think that like, that was like my first video, but if you, the real, 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 real OG Albert Oak fans, they know that I've been making videos for like 10 years. It started with like me stealing my parents' camera and making like fake Star Wars fight videos and like learning how to edit in Windows Movie Maker. Yeah, but of course. Yeah, and I just like kind of wanted to tell the story. And initially I just like sat on the video and I didn't upload it, but then quarantine happened i was like you know what i got nothing to lose and i hit upload did you i guess did that kind of blow up immediately yeah so i i titled it a little controversial and i kind of knew what i was doing i'll be completely honest i was like uh is, and like i posted on reddit and i i titled it is this considered cheating and of course, you know, like Reddit users want to like argue and just say that they know better than everyone else. So of course, I, I, I kind of, I definitely kind of knew what I was doing. And like, I knew it was going to get views. I just didn't think it was going to get views immediately. And so like, I posted it a few hours later and I saw a thousand views. I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Like, I, I know big YouTubers get thousand views in like seconds. So like, that was pretty good for me. I was pretty psyched. And then I like went to sleep, woke up the next morning. It was like at 10 K, but the counter was broken. And then I looked in the metrics. It was like at like 20, 30 K. And I was like, wait, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, what was climbing YouTube like at that time? I feel like it was not as, I don't know, as what's the word. I wouldn't say saturated at this point, but you know, there was a lot less going on back then. Yeah. Like what the, the, the channels that you had were, um eric carlson the vlog bouldering love that guy um you had udo neumann making just like those like montages of like movement analysis which were kind of harder to find i don't think many people even know that and then you had kind of magnus kind of because he wasn't even like getting that big yet and then who else was there oh geek climber and then kind of rock entry yeah and then and then i was like you know they're just like this niche that hasn't been filled, which is like commentary videos or like little video essays. And, um, and, and like, I'm not doing anything that unique. There's video essays in every other sport, like basketball or golf. Somebody's like making content about that. I was like, but just like somebody should tell the stories in climbing. Yeah. Especially for competitions. I mean, even now there's still not that much out there about competitions. Um, but yeah, so going back to your beta break videos. Um, so I guess your videos back then were more about these like little rules and they've changed quite a few of them since then. Um, they do the tapes a lot more. <laughs> um, I mean, you can't put your finger in bolt holes. Um, even now, like with Brooke stepping in the bolt holes, they're like starting to create walls that don't have bolt holes at all. <laughs> so... Is that um, 
is that maybe part of why the beta break series stopped or what happened to those videos and so like I would like to think that I had some ripple effect in the rule books in IFSC. That'd be pretty cool to say. I, I don't. I'm not actually sure. That'd be kind of funny because, like, I definitely put a spotlight on IFSC. Was like, hey, there are clearly rules, but can you let the athletes get away with it? Because it like lets me have really good content, and it's really fun. But I eventually did start running into like some copyright issues with the broadcasting company of IFSC. Not IFSC so much themselves. Um, I actually have like a very good relationship with IFSC. They're they're awesome. They treat me well. They got me in the commentary booth. That was like a dream come true. And hopefully, if I'm doing my work well, then maybe I'll even compete at an IFSC World Cup. So that'd be cool. But so like I think the broadcasting company, you know, like. They, they don't like that. They don't like when you use their footage, which is which is fair. Like, you know, like I wasn't exactly asking. I was like asking for uh, forgiveness, not permission. And so after a while, they're just like, yeah, you can't exactly do that. And I was like, but 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 come on, like I, I'm getting people psyched on comp climbing. And they're like, yeah, but we're Italian. So we like are going to say no. I'm like, oh, all right, that's fair. That's fair. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you like what's the broadcasting company's name? I forget. I think like different comps or were under a different broadcasting uh, yeah. company. I guess that's yeah. what I'm kind of confused about because I thought it was like different for each uh, like World Cup location. Yeah. I think it just gets convoluted because it's like a European broadcasting company. And like, yeah, okay, America has fair use laws and like commentary over it. It's like fine. But like they definitely like got mad and. I'm sure if I really wanted to, I could have just kept getting away with it and just be like, well, you, you can't take my video down because I'm commentating over it. But at the same time, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep some good relations here. I'm going to try my best. And like, it's not that big of a deal. I'm sure I can find different videos to make. And that's what I told myself. And obviously, like, I have not done that because it's been like almost three years since I've uploaded properly. Yeah, you knew that the uh, they were going to ask you to commentate one day and you wanted to keep that relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to make them mad before I get to speak on their broadcast themselves. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, how did you manage to, I guess, like speak on the broadcast? Like, do they just ask people who are standing around? It was definitely like a, I knew a person, then you a person, then you a person <laughs> kind of chain of command. And... Uh, uh, I was able to like get in contact with Mac Room, and then so like normally I think like a ex a non finalist usually talks on the broadcast or or something like that, and um, you know every now and then make a few exceptions, um, and so I was uh, fortunate to be one of those few exceptions, and hopefully I did a good job. I I tried to, but uh, I was also too excited to watch the comp itself. Fair, yeah, no, it was really exciting to hear. I was I was so I was surprised and excited to see that you were on. It was definitely a dream come true because initially I was like, okay, I'm not going to get injured. I'm going to make the team, then not make a final and then be able to commentate. That obviously didn't happen, but then in a roundabout way, it like came true. So I was like, oh, you know, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. You made it there and that's what matters. Do you ever yeah. um, plan on returning to video making? I still love making videos and that is sort of a hard statement to say out loud and for a lot of people i'm sure to believe because they're like oh well then why aren't you making videos i'm like but i'm sure as you are now a content creator can relate that it like it's hard it is very it does hard. work yeah yeah it is a full-time job and at the rate i was doing it it was not sustainable if i want to train and work and make videos and have a social life and coach people. How can one person do that? And like, I'm already cutting back sleep as it is. I'm already like, you know, eating while standing up. Like that is not healthy, right? So I'm sure there's gonna be a time and place for that. I, I have like a Google document with over 200 video ideas that I could love to pick up. And I don't know. It's it's something that is always like in my soul, in my heart. I love creating, but I just don't know when. And I'm sure there'll be a right time. Um, last night or two days ago, I did make a really fun meme on Instagram. I so, you know, <laughs> so like, I, every now and then I just got to put something out in the world for the world to enjoy. Maybe shorter form content. But yeah, I would 
like to explore different topics. I wanted to make some documentaries. I was even in the midst of making a documentary um, about the Snowbird World Championship, which is in Utah. Uh, and that was like the first climbing world championship that was like ever officially a thing. And all the legends are already in town. Like Boone Speed's here. Like I can like talk to like half of the people that were at the comp and I, I want to ask them what parties did they do? Like what was the after party like? And like these kind of the questions and see like a little fun side of the story, but in, in, in due time, I'm sure. Yeah. Have you been to after parties at the World Cup season too? <laughs> uh, I've been to the Salt Lake City after party at... Uh, Crazy enough, it's Boone Speed's uh, factory for grasshopper boards. So, like, full circle, I'm sure he was hosting an after party after when he was at the World Cups, and then he's get able to pass on the torch. But and I like went out to some of the bars and clubs and after Chamonix to like hang out with some of the athletes. But like, it, it was, it's difficult because like it, it, as a as a coach, I uh, my I'm like I'm trying to hang out and have fun, but like I'm like okay, what can my athlete do? Like the whole time. Uh, I think the day after speed qualies in Chamonix, I was down at the bars and like everyone else is getting drunk. And uh, so one of my athletes had made finals and I'm there studying on my phone the whole time. Like a, like a half drinking beer in my hand, um, like scrubbing, scrubbing and like analyzing. And like one of the French athletes comes like, what's, what's so important that you're doing right now instead of having fun? I'm like, you don't understand. My mind is not here right now. I am thinking about what what's next. Like the, like I, I would like to party and like relax, but like I can't do that. That's like not who I am. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised that other athletes would be there because wouldn't they also have to be preparing for the next day? Um, I think it was the majority of the athletes who hadn't made finals. So yeah, I guess like only 16 people were or 32 on both sides of the bracket. So like yeah, those people were comfortably sleeping, but I'm like you know, I'm there plugging in everything. It's like, all right, I gotta, I gotta figure it out. I gotta like figure what's the next step. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's exactly what you want from a coach. So. Yeah. I think if I make a, a, a world cup, I'm going to tell all my athletes like, yo, look, I'm sorry. I'm going to go party. Bye. You, you're on your own for this one time. <laughs> Oof, okay. Yeah. They might just, be hoping on your downfall. Then. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I'm like, guys, just let me, let me have this one, one time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I guess moving into like the coaching and speed climbing stuff, um, what first drew you to speed climbing? When I was in high school, I was a pretty prominent 110 meter hurdler. Um, I definitely, I think uh, like th there's like some records there that you can find my name on the internet somewhere, but like I, I was definitely above average fast. I think if the trajectory was still consistent, I probably would have ran track in college and maybe beyond. Um, and I loved it. Like I, I am like a short distance athlete and hurdles was interesting because I didn't have a coach and the coach didn't really care about me because in the hundred meter itself, I was not fast, but in the 110 meter hurdle, I was faster than the others because my form was so good. I would just analyze over and over and over again, like footage of other higher end uh, professional hurdlers and try to break down what they're doing and what exercises they're doing. And I would spend like hours after school just by myself doing a single hurdle over and over and over and over again until my form was perfect. And so I was able to keep my like slower end hundred meter speed, but like never lose speed because my hurdling was so accurate. And so of course, but I stopped hurdling and, you know, like my whole life unraveled, went to university and whatever, but I start climbing and then what's like the next best thing to hurdles? Speed climbing. Because this is just vertical hurdles. You're just, yeah. And I initially never had an access to a speed wall. Uh, I was coaching in Grapevine, Texas, and they had like a 10 meter, but it was just like, it was like kind of like scuffed. Like the, it, it was not, not like it was borderline dangerous <laughs> uh, at least by the time I was using it. And so I was in Colorado for a couple of years working and I got back to Houston and they have a speed wall there. I'm like, of course this is it. Like, and I, on my birthday in January 10th, I was like, well, this is time to do it. I have to do it now or else I'm going to regret not doing it. And 
thus began the journey and you can see a direct correlation of when my video stopped and when I started speed climbing. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, they like go hand in hand because like you just can't do all five things in the yeah. world. Yeah, so. Okay, interesting. So, I, I mean, you didn't start out as a speed climber because you didn't have access to a wall. Did you like know that you still wanted to do speed climbing even though you had just started climbing? Mm, absolutely. Um, so I started top rope. <laughs> I was a top rope hero, then transitioned into lead slash boulder. And I even went to a few bouldering open nationals, um, 2018, 2021. Yeah. And like tried pretty hard, got absolutely dunked. Those boulders are so hard. Like if, if, if anyone's like, oh, I bet I could do that. And it's like, no, trust me, you, you cannot. They're, they're beyond, like even just the qualifiers of a US national round is just insane. Like the easiest boulder there is a comp style V9. And so <laughs> I, I kind of knew that like, okay, look, I didn't start climbing when I was six. I'm never going to have the tendon strength. I'm never going to have like the skill sets. Like I can gain strength, sure. But it's always going to be harder for me to ever be at that top level of bouldering. But like speed, you, you just need to know a pattern very, 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 very well. Have strong legs and strong arms. I'm like, okay, I've got strong le arm, uh, legs. I can just do some weighted pull-ups and get stronger arms eventually. And so that's kind of why I knew it. It's just when I didn't have access to a speed wall was um, the only reason why I couldn't get on the speed wall. Um, yeah, access to a speed walls is a lot harder than a lot of people would think. It is so hard. Yeah. I, I would still really want to try it, and I just have never gotten the opportunity to find one. Yeah. Oh, I, I think there's like one in Reno and what? cup to salt lake yeah reno why yeah. i i don't know i think there's one at the mesa rim there i didn't even know there was a mesa rim there that's insane yeah okay. or you can just come to salt lake and then come to my thursday class at 6 30 p.m oh you teach a class <laughs> yes okay uh, i mean i might i just yeah i might i'll have to hit you up for that um uh, i it is so hard to find a speed wall is it ever like even if a place has a speed wall, is it ever like busy and you have to like wait for people to get on? I would say busy, no. Insurance liability, very difficult to manage. Um, I think it's no longer, but Dallas was probably the only speed wall in America that wasn't like locked up. Oh, seriously? Yeah. It, oh, so it, they're all a, locked up. Yeah, they're usually all locked up. You either need to call in advance or have like a coach call in for you, be like, yo, my athlete's going to come and they're going to train on it. Like, let them do it. They're training for a national cup, but it's hard to access it. Yeah. yeah. So then how do you even train for it? If I mean, do you need to have like a legitimate reason? Like I'm trying to be in a world cup to like get on the wall? For a lot of gyms, kind of, yeah. And like, I, I've heard of some gyms even charging like $50 an hour just to use it. But, and it, and it does make sense because it is a huge insurance liability. It's an auto belay. Huge accidents happen with auto belays and it's going to be the tallest auto belay in the gym usually. So yeah, I've like heard some horror stories, even like one of the athletes I help uh, coach uh, uh, online, he um, didn't clip in and fell and shattered everything whoa still is better than 99.999 percent of speed climbers out there he's like at, he was at the world champs and i think he got like 20 something or 30 something plays so like he's doing incredibly well now but like just the implications of an audible a and like supervision it's scary forgetting to clip in on a speed route mm -hmm. i can't even imagine and like that doesn't even cover like the accidental, like maybe the gate is like semi-closed and like just unwind somehow magically, which which has happened. Um, what are you going to do? Like, that's it. Liability. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of gyms still have auto belays. I know at my old gyms, they actually got rid of them because it was too mm. much of a liability. But um, I'm surprised that they just like keep the speed ones so locked down if other auto belays are still open. Yeah, uh, I'm, usually the setup I've seen at gyms is like the auto belay is over like more padded flooring or something or like they're on shorter walls. Not not necessarily all of them. 
yeah. but like yeah it was like at a height you could survive the ground fall but 15 meters is a very long way to fall onto concrete because mm-hmm. um usually they level out the flooring for speed walls so it meets the regulation height mm-hmm. so you're gonna hit some hard ground not just like padding but yeah i i empathize with the people who want to try speed and at the same time i empathize with the gyms because i'm like oh man that is a nightmare to deal with yeah Wow, yeah, it's a lot more difficult to get into speed than I thought. Yeah, I, I want to say that the gym that I started speed climbing at, like there was a no clip accident, like twice that happened. So they put a lock and key on that very, very, very adamantly. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can definitely see both sides there. Um, and so how did you get into speed coaching specifically? I, w- I was a coach in, in Texas, in Dallas, for uh, quite a bit of time for bouldering and, uh, I guess, lead climbing. Just You just end up coaching both. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be mentored by very high-level coaches um, throughout, like, international coaches even. Um, and so I started speed climbing, and I'm, like, figuring it out myself, and I'm coaching myself this whole time. And I kind of realized after a while, like, okay, I'm not ever going to be as good as Sam Watson that will ever be. But I'm like starting to see that a lot of speed climbers in the world are like making mistakes a lot more than I expected. I'm like, okay, but how do I help those people without like beta spraying them as per se? And yeah, and like I don't have a name to myself. Like, no, I'm not a professional speed coach. In fact, there's like only a handful of them in the world. So it's like, how do I like make that a thing? And so I just started helping people at the gym. And then that became into a thing where I made an Instagram post over a year ago now. I was like, hey, if you need help, I may not be the best, I may not be the worst, but I'm more than nothing. If you need help speed coaching, I will help you as much as I can. And then it like caught on like wildfire. I probably had like 40 DMs that day and I was like, oh, what have I done? It was just, it was just a joke. I was just joking. I was just joking. But then I was like, oh, but actually this is kind of cool. Like I finally feel like I can make a difference uh, in a small microcosm, in a micro niche, in a way that like matters to me. And that eventually translated into like, athletes coming to Salt Lake just to like work with me and, and me help them. And I, I believe you even inter, uh, released the podcast with Grace and they even uh, transitioned into letting me help them work with them technically. And they made some huge leaps and strides and sort of people just start like talking and they're like, oh, who helped you? It's like drop like, how did you drop 0.8 seconds in like a month? Oh, Albert. I'm like, oh. Thanks for giving me credit. I didn't ask for credit, but if y'all are going to credit me, sure. So it's been cool uh, in that way. Obviously, I'm super analytical, or at least I try to be. And I try to find the details. And that came from all started when I like tore my shoulder and I was watching videos to make beta break. So like full circle, here I am coaching athletes in speed, but it all came from because I couldn't walk or breathe or use my arm and watched lots of old videos of world cups. Yeah. I mean, also with your hurdling as well, I guess. Yeah. Like it's always been like that. I I don't know. I've never had coaches in my life. Like everything I've done is like, okay, nobody's going to help you. You kind of have to figure out yourself. And there's, it's kind of a painful thing to admit, but I don't want to see other athletes go through that. Um, because it, it was a struggle. Like I saw other athletes and other like disciplines, like, and not even just in sports that they had like resources, their parents were helping them. They had like five different coaches. They had like sports psychologists. I'm like, I had me and YouTube and a camera and that's got to suck for if an athlete has nowhere, like nowhere to talk to. Like they don't even have anybody like just, Oh, my session was bad today. They can't even say that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I kind of just like wanted to fill that, gap for people so they never have to go through what I went through because that was not so easy. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's kind of how it is for a lot of even like just like professional athletes, um, weekend warrior athletes, anything like that. Um, Yeah. It can really make all the difference. Even myself, I got like a coach and I felt like 
even if I don't get anything out of it, I don't know what's going to come of it, but it's just nice to like talk to someone and like talk to someone about your climbing and have it be like focused on your climbing and you can like vent. It's like a, it's like a sports therapist. What do you think has been the yeah biggest difference for you now that you have a coach versus when you weren't? Honestly, I'm doing like a physical training stint right now, which I've never done before because I'm not like an athlete um, or like a physically active person <laughs> in general. Um, and so right now I actually am climbing awful. Like I hate it. Um, I feel like I can't do, do anything. I'm so tired and weak. Um, so if anything, it's been really bad, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful that what everyone says about, oh, you'll like physically train. And then after in a few weeks, you'll feel like really amazing and strong and climb harder than ever before. I just have to hope that that's true and real and that it actually works for me. Um, but if not, at least the, uh, the sports therapy was there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Like Sam right now is what we call in strength cycle jail, which you are also sounds like in strength cycle jail. You just have to actually trust the process and it is so scary and daunting. It's like, Oh, but like, what if it, what if it does it? And like, it always does, but it just sucks. So it's so demoralizing. Okay. It's like, dude, I can't even climb V1 right now. What is happening? It's like, no, no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I promise. Okay, <laughs> but, yeah. That's good to know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I just have to like go through this once and then if it works, hoping it does, then in the future I can be like, okay, like this is normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what comes of that. Sam had his first glimpses of escaping strength cycle jail today. So we know it's working. It's just, it's so hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, is this like his first time like going through this strength training? He's been through different strength cycles, but this is probably the hardest he's been through. And so like the past couple of weeks that we've been working, it's like just making sure he's not demoralized and hates everything after a session. Cause he's like, there's no way I'm this slow. I'm like, no, no, it's fine. You'll be fine. Just give it time. What's he's the difference fine. with this and before? Um, it's just uh, focusing a lot on making the movements very strict and very like, deliberate so i'm sure his like nervous system and central nervous system is being taxed and his muscles are being taxed so his coordination feels off on the wall and yeah yeah that's probably like the biggest feeling right yeah it's yes. everything yes. oh my god okay well i <laughs> like, feel better now just talking about it so that's good yeah it's like wait my hand's not closing it's like i it will close later okay okay, okay. i feel better I feel better. Yeah. That's good. You'll be on a strength cycle deal soon, I promise. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot better now, thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, what, so you're coaching Sam. Um, what other climbers are you coaching? Grace, one of them. And it kind of goes crazy because, like, I'm, like, kind of coaching a lot of people. Um, like, there's a, so a South African co uh, athlete, Tiguin. She just messaged me a bunch of videos there's uh, piper kelly she's on the u.s team that i'm like kind of also working with and there's like noah brachi i'm also kind of working with zach hammer i was kind of working with so there's a lot of people i'm like kind of working with i don't feel comfortable taking the official title it's like yo i'm their official coach because i don't know it's just like that's just Am I like dodging responsibility or something? I, I don't. Maybe that's a that's a psychotherapist question I need to ask. Like, oh, what is happening? I don't. I don't know. But like, I I think there's probably if I really listed it out, there's like over forty athletes, and some are international. Um, I just had an athlete finish at the Iranian national championship, some like an Iranian cup, and uh, he he didn't exactly go as far as he expected to or wanted to, but he was like very grateful. It's like, I learned a lot. I was like, that, that makes me more happy. Um, there's like a Pakistani climber that will be climbing at the Asia championship quite soon. And he's hopefully I'm like crossing my fingers for him. And yeah, there's like a lot of climbers out there that just will never have access to a speed coach or strength coach or just a coach in general. So I'm like, well, if there's anything I can do, then that's going to be the gap I fill. Oh, man, I, I should probably list out all the people and like what levels of coaching I am coaching them because I've been asked this quite a few times. 
I just say probably around like 40 athletes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then you also have, you know, kind of like a resume of your coaching resume. Mm -hmm. Which is probably something I should do at some point. Good reminder. Thank you. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to keep doing, keep going with yeah. the coaching. Um, yeah, you have a few World Cup athletes in there. What's it like coaching at the World Cup specifically? Please excuse this brief intermission, but I would just like to take some time and remind you that if you are enjoying this podcast, please follow and rate it on your preferred listening platform. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Anything helps to push this podcast out to more people and get even more amazing guests on. Back to the show. What's it like coaching at the World Cup specifically? It, it, it was interesting. Uh, this when I was at Villars in Chamonix, and it was a very, like, I got back, and everyone said, oh, you had so much fun in Europe. That must have been so much fun. I'm like, it was very fun. It was absolutely very fun. It's Europe. Of course, it's something new, and uh, it's... It's cool experience, but at the same time, it was very much work in the like fulfilling way. It, it like I, I don't know. I just felt very devoted because like um, this was kind of just after I got out of the hospital, so my energy levels were just tanking all the time. But I was trying to like just manage most of the time. I was like manage expectations, manage their scheduling every day, and um, just like you know something something as simple as just carrying their bags for them. Or, or, or is that is like is enough to like help more than what I was doing, and um, there there always comes the point when the athlete needs the talk, and I'm like, yo, I, I'm not that much older than you right now, but like I will try my best to put my mentor hat on and try to like you know like tell you that yo this is will not define you no matter what the result is. And like when you actually truly believe in yourself, you can try your best kind of speech. And it is daunting because I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm qualified for that. Like absolute imposter syndrome. I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, how did I get here? <laughs> I'm like seeing all the other World Cup coaches that are like, you know, in their collared shirt and they have like, like four iPads running at the same time. They have a notebook. I'm like, hi, I make memes on the internet. Like that's about it. <laughs> And I, I don't know, it like, it was, it was interesting. So like, it was real, uh, I was helping primarily Grace, um, Chadwick Horton, who it sort of came on there. And then Isis uh, Rothfork, who she recently won the youth junior world, uh, national championship. And, um, Grace ran their uh, comp PR. And it was a hard wall to do that on because the, the wall's very slippery for the Tomo skip. Chadwick also almost broke sub seven for the first time in his life, but ran his like all-time PR that time. And so I was like, just trying to juggle and do it as much as I could. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what to do as well. <laughs> like, I think all the other coaches there, they have done this, been there, done that like several times. They're comfortable, they're relaxed. I'm there biting my nails. I'm freaking out. I'm screaming louder than everyone else. And at the same time, I'm like, oh, I could be an athlete or I want to have fun. I want to go party. I want to go hang out with some people. But like, and it's like, oh no, this is, I should take this seriously. Like I have to take this seriously. That's like my duty. Um, so it, it was a really eye-opening experience. And I think it gives me more experience in, in the future for other World Cups. Uh, I'll be able to manage it a lot better there. Yeah, this is your first one, right? Um, arguably second ish. Cause I was like doing a lot of support staff at Salt Lake world cup, which was also a very weird, interesting thing because I had, I was coaching multiple international athletes as well, but I was not listed as an official coach either. And so I made some dis executive decision calls that I don't think the USA climbing were exactly the biggest fan of, but in my mind, I was like, this is probably like the best thing to do. And they kind of like got a little mad at me. <laughs> uh, we gotta hear about what these are. I don't think it's like a big deal, and I don't think and there's like obviously there's no bad blood between all of them. But like there was like this, we had the option to warm up at the Mill Creek Gym and then go to the venue, and 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 I was like, well, if it's for speed, wouldn't you want to get your laps in ahead of time? So the average speed climber, we train to be our best on our fourth lap. 
and like we get progressively better so like by the sixth lap and maybe up to the eighth lap you were like really good and these athletes i was working with i'm like yo i'll, I'll be completely honest y'all are probably not gonna make finals but you can make a dent in with the standings and try your best. So it's like, let's get you two laps in at Mill Creek so you're not on your third or fourth lap for your qualifiers. Because normally you get two practice laps and then you have your quality one, quality two. And so I was like, okay, why don't we just game the system? Just go to Mill Creek, warm up there, and then you're on your fifth and sixth lap by the time you're at uh, qualies. Which was like, in my mind, that was a no-brainer. If you have access to the gym, you should use it. Like, absolutely. But apparently, they wanted them to be at the training center warming up, like, on a spray wall. And I'm like, dog, wait. Just call you can warm up on the speed wall instead of the spray wall. And so, like, to me, that was, like, a no-brainer. And we got there. And then, apparently, they, like, kind of, like, somebody told me, it's like, yeah, they weren't a big, the biggest fan of that. I was like... I'm sorry. I, I just made the executive decision. And eventually later, they actually kind of like sort of agreed with me. They're like, oh, that was a good idea. I was like, yeah, that's okay. As long as you don't hate me. So it wasn't like against like rules of the World Cup. It was just they didn't yeah. think it would be the best warm up for them. Yeah, because they wanted like all the teammates together. And I was like, well, uh, they could be together at the gym. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I had no idea about like it being what the fourth run is the best and then after it's even better um so then a bit about i guess warming up for speed um at different world cups you said that the wall um at some of them were a bit more slick mm -hmm. this has been like a very difficult situation that uh a lot of my athletes have been facing where they train on a wall that has good texture which is you know it's fine like that's pretty average but even a wall that is brand new at a world cup the painting that they'll put over it or like the the actual coating is slick so they have to be within a standard regulation of grit level which is fine but the a literal coating can make something very slippery or not and so at world champs you saw athletes not make finals because mm -hmm. they slipped on the tomorrow skip like yeah, that's crazy so yeah like does that happen a lot Absolutely. Um, at Salt Lake World Cup, that was like kind of like a funny World Cup because you just saw people just like eat it on the start move. Uh, like, and the really strong athletes and really fast athletes, yeah, they can get over it. But like the athletes who are just below that level, they need that bit of friction and relying on the smear for the Tomo skip is really important to them. And they didn't have that. So yeah, that was kind of my thinking. And then so I've like tested every environment for slick surfaces. And one of the reasons why Salt Lake World Cup was so slippery for the qualifiers was it was baking in the sun. And so in theory, hot rubber on like a hot surface gets a lot of friction. But because the shoes on rubbers like deteriorate and get slippery when they get too hot, it's like better to cool them off because you're putting it on a hot surface. And like, I've tested everything before. And so then I was like, guys, we need to cool off our shoes. And then like some athletes were like flaming me. They're like, that's stupid. Hot rubber, like they heat up Formula One tires on hot. I was like, yeah, but we're not Formula One cars. We're not like a one ton car. We're like very light. And so like the rubber is completely different. I was like, and then later on, <laughs> apparently I overheard that like, Somebody brought up, was like, hey, I have a great idea. We should cool down our shoes. And I was like, wait, that was my oh. idea that y'all were framing me for. But like, uh, like I, I like had thought of so many like solutions. And now one of the recent things to prepare the athletes is like we went to Home Depot and me and Grace actually, and we <laughs> found a bunch of surfaces that are slippery. So we're just going to put it there on the wall, do the Tomo skip. If you can do it on plexiglass, you can do it anywhere you want. Oh, you would do it on glass. Yeah, like plex uh, yeah, plastic plexiglass. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah, I just, I can't imagine. I I mean, I guess it was just wishful thinking that all of the walls would feel exactly the same because it should be the same route every time. Um, yeah, I can't imagine how hard it would be to just be feeling something different on a route that you've practiced so many times that should be the same thing because i'm it kind of it's kind of it kind of reminds me of that thing with stairs where people say like oh if there's like a third a quarter inch difference in a stair you can like feel it and you'll like trip 
So, yeah, that must be really hard if it's different at different World Cups. Yeah, I, I don't know. Have you by chance ever played like instruments? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like if you have your violin versus someone else's violin, it's oh, you just could tell different. I'm a violin player. <laughs> oh no, I, I, that was a pure yeah. guess. I was just that was an absolute pure guess. But no, it's yeah, a good like, guess. Right, like because like it just feels slightly off and it's like oh it's the same size violin if it was like okay like a half size violin versus a full size yeah okay there's a difference there but like it's it's a violin it should be the same and it is so different it is a world different it is almost the same concept in, in speed climbing like, yeah even like because when they pour the holds of course there's going to be a level of tolerance of uh, incongruencies so even some holds on the same route poured from the same manufacturer during the same day are different. And we can tell that. And so I guess when there's like more grip, it helps quite a lot. I think at one of the Speed World Cups this year, there were like a lot of records getting broken. Um, mm-hmm. Was that in Korea or? Yeah, Korea. That wall is like a, a god tier wall. Like the texture is amazing. The holds were good, and so of course Vadrik just like destroyed it. Went four nine zero, and then every comp after that kind of like went down a little bit. But then people got better, so then went back up. So yeah, you got to, to see some uh, trends. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I guess speaking of Vadrik, um, why are some countries like? Indonesia so good at speed climbing, but maybe not other disciplines. I recently made like a, a very niche in-group meme. So there's a photo of the Beijing uh, uh, team for speed climbing and they have like eight lane wall. They have like four trainers on hand. They have a lead wall. They have like weightlifting. They live in a hotel together. They do everything. Everything's paid for. And I like showed this photo to people. It's like, Hey, what do you what team do you think this is for? And they're like, uh, that seems that's like the Chinese national team, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just take one more guess. And they're like, this is their development team. The development team has an eight-lane speed wall that is like enclosed, no distractions. The development team in the United States of America, you get a discounted day pass at Momentum Mill Creek. <laughs> so that is the level of resources put into the sport by the Federation and the nation. And so in Indonesia and China, they live together, eat together, breathe together. They train together. They're always together. So like you always have somebody pushing you that day. Over here for the last like two weeks, Sam has been racing me and I'm a full second and a half slower than him. I'm never going to push him as much as like somebody who could. And the the biggest thing, and I think this goes across anything in any discipline, is like having that strong community. You see the Italian, uh, like, who's the best boulders? France, Slovenia, and for, like, lead climbing? They, like, always climb together. They always live together. In Japan, I'm sure you've heard the stories of, like, we just session together at B-Pump. We don't train. We just, like, cl- tr- try really hard. Exactly. Like, if you have the community where everyone is on board and just trying really hard, naturally the whole country gets better. So... Yeah, you must do a lot of analysis of other speed climbers as well. Um, can you think of any like intricacies of certain athletes that you find interesting? Oh man, like speed climbing is the easiest way to see if somebody's deficient in a muscle group or not. And it is like to maybe like the untrained eye, it's like oh yeah, it just looks like they're going fast. But like I can immediately tell which athlete is like upper arm heavy, uh, leg heavy. Are their arms long? I can tell that. I can tell what height they probably are based on the way that they move. Um, And so this kind of goes back to like the whole 1980s and like uh, 1990s World Cup bouldering because the holds were very like basic. And that's how you could determine how the person was moving. Because speed climbing is like that, like there is probably more stylistic differences at a minute level than at first seeing. Someone like Sam, you can very categ- like uh, easily categorize him as a very accurate climber. He may not be like the strongest climber upper body wise, but when you see Reza, it's like, oh, clearly this guy does like pull-ups every day with like 200 pounds on his back. And he's just like ripping holes off the wall. And it looks very clunky, but it is still very fast. And Vedrik, it's like, okay, this guy is like clearly every single muscle in his body was designed to speed climb. And that, that was, it's just like, yeah, his legs and arms are perfect. There is no deficiency. He has just like really good skill. 
Um, there's some climbers that like on speed that are running very fast times, but it looks like a wild ride. It looks like they yeah. have no control of what's happening, but they still get to the top very fast. Um, there's climbers like Ludovico who often people are like, Oh, he doesn't look that fast. And then you look at the time he like ran a five Oh, it's like, Oh no, that was very fast. He's tall and he's very graceful and elegant. So it looks very smooth. Um, I think with, especially on the female side, you see bigger differences in styles because uh, the, the, the center of gravity of them, uh, it, it varies a lot big more than uh, on the men. And so it is so like beautiful to, I wish like I could motion capture every single speed athlete and just have that like just playing over and over again to see like how they move and the biomechanics of it. But yeah, I don't know. I, I think you would, if you could try speed, probably understand a lot more about yourself as well as a climber than at first glance seems. Yeah. Is, uh, is taller better? <sighs> Arguably no. Um, there's probably like a you are too tall for this ride kind of height. Um, I'd say like if you're six two, six three, that's like your reaching limit. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. There could be better betas out there for taller people. Um, so Ludo, you have at the highest end Ludovico, who's always making finals, and the low end where you have like Vidrico, I, I believe it's like five four, five five. He's like tiny in standards. Like he's like but yeah like half a foot if not more shorter than ludovico and he's speeding it i'd say like from just a biomechanics standpoint you see the fastest sprinters in the world for the first 60 meters are all very short and then the tall guys take over after that usain bolt he was criticized oh he starts slow but he's always going to beat you later on and so since speed is such a short race you don't have time to build up speed um so being taller it's probably worse, but then you just have people making it work. So who knows? We don't have enough data and there's not enough tall climbers out there to even just like make that assumption. But I'm going to say like 5'10 and under is like that nice ratio. Yeah, going back to um, like intricacies of certain athletes, uh, I'm a very casual <laughs> speed viewer. Um, so yeah, I don't have... Uh, I guess, all the information on um, what makes a better speed climber. Um, and of course, uh, Alexandra Miroslaw is always um, up there, except at the World Champs, which was kind of a shame Crazy. to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I feel like the only thing I've noticed is that at the top of her run, she just kind of like blasts off. I don't know mm -hmm. what it is. What is that? Her beta is very in tune with somebody who's a shorter height. Um, there are more foot movements than somebody taller betas would do. And because of that, it's like hard to do because you need to be A, more accurate per percentage of footholds. And then B, you have to move your feet really fast. But if you can accomplish that, she just like overpowers it. And this is going to be a crazy statement, but like, Alexandra Miroslav is not even close to like technically perfect. She has like, she could still probably go like a full 0 0.4, 0 0.5 faster than she's already going. She is so strong. She kind of gets away with things that like a weaker climber wouldn't be able to get away with technically. Um, but yeah, I'd be, I would love one day if she was like, if I, if I was like, honored, bestowed honored enough to like help her te technical wise, Cause like, she's not even close to the limit. Like, and it's, that's like the insane part. Like she could go even faster. So I, I'm honestly like terrified for the rest of the athletes. I was like, yo, she's going to run five, eight and you, you're not going to know what's coming. Uh, and it's just a matter of time until either she figures that out or adapts to that. Exciting. I hope, uh, I hope she'll see this one day and, uh, yeah. you know, call you up. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. She is an insane climber regardless. She's faster than me by a mile. So uh, I got work to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and huge upset for her at the uh, world champs. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure she'll make it in eventually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thinking about the Olympics, now that it's its own separate category, um, do you know what that format is going to be like? Like same as the World Cups or something different? I like don't know off the top of my head, which is kind of bad just because like I always forget because it's very convoluted. 
it's since there's 14 athletes, it's like they do some seeding round and then they do a bracket format to determine like eight climbers. And then there's like a lucky loser that goes in and then do it. They do a bracket of eight. It is so weird. And I have to like double check. Cause like I might even be saying half of this wrong, but I think the format is going to be very volatile because like anybody could make finals and anybody could go to the end still. Um, initially I heard rumors that they were proposing like a, um, like a loser's bracket and then like uh third fourth place first second was the best two out of three which i would have loved personally uh because there was like a mathematical breakdown that if somebody lost and crawled their way to the finish they could have ran like some 20 odd runs in one day and just be like an absolute zero to hero uh which would have been a cool storyline but i i don't know i'm very curious to see how the format works and i'm going to try to uh set up some in-house tournaments that follow that format and we'll see how that works but um i like that they have a medal of their own but i'm obviously going to want more and i wish we could have a full bracket of 16 and we could have like 48 athletes uh going to the comps yeah why did they choose 14 instead of 16 I believe I, I forget the exact reason, but it was like a a, a quota per country uh, that they could fill, and like they definitely gave more spots to lead in Boulder, which is fair. Like that's like the original, but um, just the the random th- speed enthusiasts like me are begging for more. <laughs> I mean, still not even that many spots. I guess I don't know how many athletes go to other sports, but I felt like twenty and fourteen is kind of not that many. Yeah, like I know there's sports out there with like 80 athletes registered. I'm like, dang, when that could be us? Yeah, maybe one day. I mean, I yeah. hope they're I hope they're fighting for it. With with enough uh, memes and content like this, you know, maybe speed will get on the radar. <laughs> yeah, enough interest in competition climbing that would be great. I don't know what meme I'll make after the Olympic speed climbing, but like I have to make sure it goes viral enough that they like consider it next year. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then maybe they'll let you commentate there. Oh, that'd be a dream. Oh, man. Olympic commentary would just, uh, I'd probably cry. Well, I guess the channels have their own commentary, don't they? True. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That process is too much for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, back to coaching. Um, so you do speed coaching. Did you, and you said that when you were in school, you also coached like bouldering and leads? Mm-hmm. So I coach like uh, the feeder team as well as like some of the uh, athletes for Team Texas. Um, and so that's kind of where like, oh man, I may, may, maybe I do have like a knack for like helping coaching or I, like, I, maybe it's not so much I felt like I had a knack or an edge over anyone else. Just like I enjoyed it a lot more. Um, it was very fun. It was really cool to see progress in athletes that had the gifts and abilities that I've never had. Um, and so one of the bigger things that I've been doing recently is trying to band together all the athletes to Salt Lake, which has been slowly working. More athletes are moving here, especially collegiate athletes who are moving here for the U of U. But like, yeah, as I was saying like earlier, China and Indonesia, they live, eat and breathe and sleep together. And they train together all the time. We don't have that. So I'm like, what? Like, that's my job now. And so I went all the way from like banding some little kids that are running around to climb their first v1 to sort of finding this weird niche place in salt lake city that i didn't expect myself to do um one of the things i said as i left colorado is like i need to go change the world i just don't know how i don't even know if this is how it's going to happen but i feel like this is like the purpose in life for me for at least time being like that may change even tomorrow or next year or whenever, but at least for now, it's like, this is sort of it. Like, this is kind of what I have to do. And like, I love it and it's a duty and it is a duty bestowed to myself by myself. So I'll just keep doing it until somebody tells me to stop or I decide to stop. Well, I mean, that's a very noble pursuit. Um, (laughs) You mentioned that you want to, I guess, give other athletes this opportunity that you never had um but you are still trying to make national team yourself aren't you Mm -hmm. 
And it, it's been a very difficult juggling effort because during the session, I can't help myself. I'm like, okay, I can clearly see the athlete struggling. I should go say something. I should go sit, but I like, no, focus on yourself. And like, it's always like an internal struggle. And now, uh, since my handle is Professor Oak, which also, I, I, I don't know, wait, did, did you get, do you, do you get my handle on Instagram? Um, I've never thought about it that hard, to be honest. <laughs> well, okay. So there's something to get. Yeah. Um, no, it's like pretty I can't easy. say I do. It's just like from Pokemon. That's it. That's why. Oh, okay. So I never yeah. watched Pokemon. So that would be why I don't understand. Ironically, me neither. I've never seen a single episode, but I just thought like, okay, Professor Oak from Pokemon. That's like, okay, my last name's Oak. Okay, I I'll take this handle. Oh, is that like a, is that a character? <laughs> yeah, he's like one of the major characters in the thing. And like, I don't know. I just like picked it randomly. So people thought like Professor Oak meant like I'm like trying to be a professor. I'm like, no, no, no. It's like a Pokemon reference. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I kind of thought the other thing as well. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's definitely way dumber than people like want to give me credit for. I'm like, I, I don't know if I should change it, but like I can't anymore. No. <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I don't know. It's like, I want to train for myself, but like at the same time, I need to block off office hours for myself to like get my own work done. And so now, um, probably like starting tomorrow, uh, I'll let the athletes climb from like 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. and then I'll rest. And then I'm gonna start training at nights by myself because like uh, I need myself to focus on myself. And and that is a difficult endeavor. And uh, it's been like two years now since I've been trying to get on the team and it is so unbelievably hard. People have no clue how hard it is to get on team. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so like, what are you doing to make it happen? Like, do you have your own coach or still more coaching yourself? Just kind of myself. Um, I've, if there was, uh, honestly, like I kind of know what I need to do every time. I just, the, what I really need is somebody just like, hey, you're not doing this. Stop being lazy. Just do it. Stop. Bad. Like, I need somebody to, like, tell, like, read what I'm telling other people. Um, that'll be probably the biggest help. Um, and so this year's cutoff for even having a comp start is 6.02. And if you want to be on team, you need to run 5.63 or 6.2. So it's very, very, very difficult now. So like, I'm not even making the time cut off right now. So I got so much work to do. So off the wall training, uh, on the wall training. Um, I prioritize on the wall training because I lack volume right now. Um, but yeah, you, you got to lift heavy. You got to jump hard. You got to try everything and just over and over and over and just be obsessive over the details. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how you structure your bouldering training, but it's not that serious. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so with, I guess, how fast like speed records are evolving, I don't know if that's just because of the wall texture that one time. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's also just a lot of like young people coming up who like have this specific goal already in mind. Um, do you feel like you can keep up? Um, you know, Bossa Mawem is the hero of everybody because dude's 38 with two kids and he's making every final. So I'm like, oh man, I have over 10 years to like say that I can't keep up. Like I have no excuse, right? And so technically I know more than the kids, but they're going to excel at make, uh, making the adjustments faster than me. But it is just so hard. Like every week there's some new sub six climber in the world. And I'm like, dude, y'all need to stop. It's, it's getting a little out of hand. And somebody's breaking a PR. Somebody's getting close to sub five. And it, it, it gets hard to keep up. But I feel like that's kind of what makes it more fun. Because, um, yeah, if everybody was bad and you got to be the best, would that be something you want in your life? I don't I don't know. Like, it, I, I want a challenge. Yeah. And so I get to be from the bottom crawling my way up to there. I don't think I would ever be at the level where I would win a World Cup ever. Um, that's being brutally honest with the amount of time I have and like the mental fortitude and strength and health. Um, but to be at the level where it's like very competitive, I think it's possible. Um, I just need some time. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. You have some time. Um, and yeah, you brought up Basa Mawem. 
Um, he also had a really bad injury that he came back from. Um, so it's good to see him competing again. That's nice. And I guess speaking of injuries, you've also had your fair share of injuries. <laughs> I'm uh, the poster child of getting in the hospital and just dying. <laughs> yeah. How? Yeah. So what kind of injuries have you dealt with? <laughs> Um, just like from childhood to now, let's uh, let's start from toe to head. So I've uh, my p- left pinky toe is permanently dislocated, and it, I can like pop it in and out any time I want. I fully ruptured all the ligaments in my left foot because I did a flip onto a a, a, a sprinkler head, and it just like collapsed into me. <laughs> uh, I've partially damaged uh ruptured my left meniscus and fully root cap meniscus on my right acl mcl lcl full tear surgery um twice 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 (laughs) um and then i've had shoulder surgery where i tore three out of four rotator cuff muscles like slap tear bank heart lesion like full labral tear like full nine yards and then very recently i had uh septic elbow bursitis that like put me in the hospital so fast and I am the most stubborn guy. I'm like, Oh, I don't need the hospital. I'm better than that. But (laughs) yeah. Um, are all these climbing related or none of these? The crazy thing is like almost none of them are climbing related. It's just like by proxy life things. Or it's like, there is no way I got that unlucky, especially with the septic bursitis. I was like, I didn't do it anything abnormal that day mm-hmm. um and then yeah, how did that happen again i i don't know like i definitely bumped my elbow but i do that every session i'm sure every climber does and then about two hours later i was like oh my elbow's kind of fat oh huh, swollen oh huh, that's not that's not normal and then six hours later i was like shivering my like organs were collapsing i was like guys i think this is not good I was stubborn and I held out going to the hospital for about like three days. And I, uh, Holy crap. Three days. It, it's, it, it was not cold. It was like hot in Salt Lake. It's like 90 degrees. I had two pairs of like sweaters on jeans, two blankets, and I was shivering, like just shaking. Like, and I'm pretty sure my organs, like my organs were collapsing at that point. Like they were failing. They were proper failing. I get to the hospital. They're like, huh, you're, you're not doing too hot. Are you? And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. Um, I'll, I'll be good. And at this time I was hosting like sort of a mini speed boot camp for a lot of the athletes before, uh, Bilaris and Chamonix. And so like they're video calling me when they're at the gym and I'm like, yeah, that looks, that looks good. Okay, cool. Bye. And I just like went back to passing out. Oh my goodness. And uh, so, that's not great. Yeah. I can use my elbow a little bit more than I used to. Um, not 100% yet, but I have a poster behind me, uh, a whiteboard that says post-hospital personal best. So I reset the counter to like every attempt after going to the hospital, I count as like a new personal best. So that's been motivational. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to think of it. I think it's always hard coming back after an injury. Yeah. Um, do you feel like mentally that's been difficult for you or have you have you been able to push through that? I think... I am probably the best person for all of this stuff to happen to because I am more resilient than I know so many people are. Um, my friend tore his ACL and he was like, wait, six months later, you were like running and you didn't stop at all. How did you do it? Like I gained like 80 pounds and I like hate my life. I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm blessed that I'm like very psyched at all times. I'm like, okay, I'm injured now. It's a setback. I'll figure it out. Um, but this last injury was the first breaking point I think I've ever experienced because I was scared. Um, normally after 72 hours, I've gotten over anything. Like I, like I know I'll be fine. At least I've got to the point. This is the first time where I was like, Oh, this is bad. I like messaged some people. I was like, guys, I think I'm like legitimately scared this time. This is not good. And then the last day that I was taking antibiotics and they sort of said, like, if it doesn't get better, you need to get back to the hospital. The last possible day I was like hallucinating crazy, vivid hallucinations. It was terrifying. I thought there were black widows all over me. It was was like nightmare state. And then like, I went, I finally passed out sweating. 
and I like woke up and I felt a lot better. I was like, oh, I got over the hump, but I was very scared. Oh, so you didn't go back to the hospital. I so I didn't go back to the hospital and then like the antibiotics finally worked their course, but yeah. And then recently, like, because the antibiotics like just these, this is like military grade, like will kill anything, but antibiotics, like I, I'm so fatigued. Uh, as I was saying before, I took a nap before this interview because I just crash. And mentally for me, that's more hard because I'm known as like, all right, this guy's definitely on crack. He's the crackhead, like at the gym, just going 24 seven, but I don't have that energy anymore. And it's kind of hard to accept that uh, because that not only takes away from myself, but my ability to help others. And I think that gets me more frustrated. Yeah, totally fair. Do you, how long do you think it'll take for you to get that energy back? Some days I have six out of 10 days. Most days it's like four at best, maybe six months, maybe a year. That's pretty much what everything online says and what other doctor professionals have told me. And they're like, yeah, it takes a long time with that antibiotic specifically. Cause yeah, this antibiotic is like nothing like this one of the most serious antibiotics could ever be prescribed. So it's like, yeah, you're in it for the long haul. Good luck. Just take caffeine. <laughs> and so that's what I've been doing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, for sepsis, that's like, that's yeah. not good. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you'll get better soon. Get that energy back. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, that's, uh, that's crazy. But I guess maybe, once you actually get that energy back, maybe it's like that uh, that training deficit energy thing that you're yeah. talking about. So in six months, yeah. you'll you'll get those gains. Yeah. So like you and Sam may be in strength cycle jail, but like I'm in dying of fatigue jail. And then once I'm unleashed, it's, it's over. Yeah, Everyone better be scared. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll make the team and everything. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I don't want to keep you too long. I do have a few more Discord questions. Um, mm. Hopefully you have the energy. Um, yeah, first one. Uh, what do you feel stops more people from getting into speed climbing? Um, lack of introduction events, training, walls. Is that the main thing? Or do you think it's also yeah. like interest? Um, I, I feel like a lot more people are interested in Like, man, when I'm at the gym, I see so many people like, watching and like i can kind of tell that they want to try it but like they're intimidated uh intimidation is probably the biggest one but the access is just hard and that's kind of just going to be an america thing like in europe they're not clipped up at all like you can just walk up and use it because like they trust oh, people really? will clip in and be smart <laughs> so it is a very much america thing so i'm assuming most of the viewers are american um but like yeah that is that is a very america problem <laughs> that like Personally, I can't do much to fix. Um, I have my class on Thursdays that like is open for anyone because the instructor's present. But like legally, it is so hard. I think the best thing is if you're interested and you can't get access is to either a message me and I'll try to talk to like the gym manager because I probably have know somebody that knows them that can like give a pass or something, or just like be really nice and talk to the gym managers and be like, hey, I'm very interested, but I'm not a professional. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, hopefully, I don't know. I mean, so few gyms have it too, just like wall height and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, did the 2020 Olympic com competition format with the combined medals undermine the development or acceptance of speed climbing, in your opinion? Ooh, I think it accelerated the development of speed as well as um, did for the average viewer create better acceptance for speed and i say uh the uh, accelerated the development because tomoa narasaki literally he's a boulder and so like he's not thinking about the speed wall like speed climbers speed climbers back then were very like stagnant in their ways this is the only way to do it you have to do it this way or it's bad and he came up with skip everyone does that nowadays except for maybe five athletes who are very tall and can do a different start and then you saw different top betas because of development so like starting to see speed climbing more as climbing as a speed climber was a huge benefit. Like Tomo and Narasaki will always be the biggest, greatest influence in speed climbing that ever existed. 
And then, yeah, so like the average viewer loves speed climbing now. They're like, oh, it's really cool. We get to see Jakob Schubert speed climb. It's funny to watch Adam Andra speed climb. He's so bad. Ha ha. So it's like you get some like funny jokes as, uh, out of it as well. So um, obviously the traditionalists like were disgruntled, but I thought it was great. And it was nice to see athletes challenged in a new way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wouldn't say a lot of people, uh, I guess, accept speed climbing um, still. Yeah, but just in general. yeah, it was yeah, it was a lot of fun watching other athletes do it, um, and they were a lot faster than I was expecting them to be, actually. Yeah, like I think all the guys were in the sixes minimum, if not faster. So I was like, yeah, yeah, no one was bad. Like they were all pretty good at it. Yeah, that was exciting to see. Um, but I guess. No more of that, unfortunately. Yeah, tragic. I'm, I'm yeah. a little bummed. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of fun. Um, do you know what the outcome of the Athletes Commission ex- election will be if a Polish or Indonesian will be representing speed and what that would mean for speed in the future? Ooh. Uh, I don't think a Polish representative would be, surprisingly, um, because... But, but there's a good potential that an Indonesian. Uh, actually, I don't know. I wouldn't even think about that either. If anything, it might be an Italian or a French climber. I guess, what are the implications? I don't actually know what the implications would mean if someone different was representing speed, or I don't even know who's representing speed right now. Yeah. Like, it should probably be an Indonesian or, or, or a Polish climber on paper. I just don't think that's what's going to happen. Mainly, most of the Indonesian climbers, they don't speak very strong English. And then the Polish climbers, they're like, uh, there's like one and a half guys that are like climbing hard in Poland, Marcin Zienski and this other youth climber. And then, yeah, the Polish female team is like insanely stacked, but then it's like a little off balance. So like, there's probably a bigger chance than an Italian or a French climber because of like the language barrier as well. So yeah, that's, that's a very tough question. Like, my money would be on a Polish or Indonesian climber, but like, I don't, I'm not sure if that would actually end up happening. Is it like they would be making different decisions for speed climbing's future or like, what would be like, what would change if it was like a Polish climber an Indonesian climber, or like a French climber? Honestly, for in terms of like the actual speed itself, like I don't think many, I think most of the speed climbers are very happy with the format and the way it works now. Just making sure that like certain warm-up procedures are followed as well as like certain timing procedures are followed is more important. But like the actual legitimate format, like we could probably run any format and people would be happy, like a round robin or like uh, a double Elon bracket. Like the more races we're going to ha- enjoy more, but we're not like dissatisfied with the format that much right now. It's volatile. It's fun. You get to, make upsets but yeah i i don't think there would be that any crazy changes and like everyone probably once a week somebody asked me oh what oh do you do are you for or against this change of the speed route i think lots of people would enjoy that i'm like okay none of y'all have actually speed climbed yet we we have yet to reach the potential of the speed route like you wouldn't change the 100 meter <laughs> route <laughs> yeah there will be a place for that eventually but not now yeah, I think when I talked to Grace a couple of weeks ago, they were saying that it's like something they have talked about, but mm-hmm. yeah, not sure if they've Absolutely. made any progress with it. They played with like a every four year kind of format, and I'm like, that'd be interesting, but I think we haven't untapped the current speed route at all. So it's like, yeah, we just keep it for a bit, a little bit longer. Um, that sort of leads into the next one about future development of speed climbing. Um, I think relay races was mentioned. You mentioned some other formats like Brown mm-hmm. Robin or other formats. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on those? It's it's really cool because in like Russia, China, and Indonesia, they do relay races and they keep Speed Classic, which is a randomized route route that they get to race on. And so they still like have old versions and like fun events like that. Um, it would be cool to see at a comp where it's like all right, the speed climbers get their own comp and they have like variations. It's like, okay, the 10 meter, who's the fastest 10 meter? Um, who's like relay race would be really fun. Um, it, it, it would be more of like a in um, in gymnastics, you have like each individual event and then the all around or like a decathlon, you have each individual event, you have the all around winner. That could be something 
kind of interesting to play with. Like, who's the best true speed climber at everything? Maybe they have an A route, a B route. Um, who knows? Like, uh, I, I would love to see it. I don't know where my place in any of those decisions would be, but if I have any influence, I will try to make my voice loud and clear um, with being in favor of those changes. How does relay work with like clipping in and stuff? <laughs> it is crazy. It is so scary because um, they normally so you have like one person uh, run the route and then they have to do it on normal like hand belay. Oh, it's just the first person, and the first person gets like lowered insanely fast oh, because that's the terrifying. second yeah. The second they finish, the second person goes, and then the next person is on auto belay, and then they go up again. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. That's so scary. And they got to get lowered within five seconds, basically. Is there, like, video of this anywhere? Like, I got to see that. I'll, I'll have to send it to you. It's It looks terrifying. They just get, like, thrown down, and, like, they get stopped at the last second. And then the... Yeah, it's usually three versus three. So the second person finishes their route. And when they hit the buzzer, the third person can finally go. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. Um, I mean, even just like like top rope belaying someone up a speed route, you must just be like pulling the rope like crazy. Yeah, there's been like crazy deck stories when it used to be top roping like all the time. So like this is like one of the wildest things you'll see, especially like yeah, everyone's going five seconds. It's not it's not just anything normal. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's insane. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. Um, all right, last one, and it's a bit of a different one. What was it like to rock climb with a Kiyonaguchi? I didn't know you did that, but oh, someone knew. Oh, this is one of the most nearest and dearest moments of my entire life. So Aww. I <laughs> we went to Joe's Valley as like a sort of a big group, and then later on we I took her to a little Cottonwood Canyon she is is better than everyone first off just like absolutely yeah, of climbs perfectly destroyed this v12 like third go or something that was it's pretty hard to flash like every v8 we touched and she's always just sitting down and watching the climbs and like just learning and just like looking at the rock and just staring and staring and staring she's always like you can tell she's like the gears are turning but the most important moment that came out of all of that was on the drive down to little from Little Cottonwood Canyon back to the city, it is gorgeous. And there's a certain turn that like opens up and you see like the whole city and it is the most gorgeous valley. And I have a sunroof. And then I was like, hey, Akio, like, let's play a song. And then she, uh, we ended up picking uh, uh, Dancing Queen by ABBA. I opened the sunroof and like, I think she kind of just like understood the assignment. She like got out of the sunroof and just like did this in the wind and like i'm slowing down and she sees the beautiful valley and she i think she even put it at the very end of one of her vlogs uh that very scene and i knew what that scene meant like i don't think other people knew the context but i was like that was kind of beautiful because in japan you aren't allowed to climb outdoors if you're on the team during the season because legal liability or uh, insurance liability because you can get hurt and so she's gone to all these World Cups. This is the first one she's gone as a spectator and could go outdoors. And I don't know. I like to think in my mind that like that was like the culmination. But like, yo, know, she's the dancing queen and she got the dance one last time. Uh, and spread her wings. And it, it was really wholesome and beautiful. And I was like, ah, I will remember this for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. How did you, um, I guess, how did you like get in contact with her anyway? I, uh, it was like definitely a, a friend of a friend kind of thing. Uh, and they like uh, contacted me to contact her and then she contacted me through them. And then like it worked out cause like I know a little Japanese and like I could know the area well and can communicate and I was somebody that like she could trust and it, it, it all worked out well. And apparently Tomo said he liked my photos and I'm no photographer. So I was like, yo, good job. Thanks. I pressed the button. I had no clue what I was doing. I don't know any of these settings. And so <laughs> it was a dream come true. Oh, okay. Well, that's really yeah. nice. Um, yeah. Good note to end on. Um, yeah. Well, I think that was all the questions then. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, anything you want to shout out or let people know where they can find you? Uh, there's this podcast called That's Not Real Climbing Podcast. Oh, that, that <laughs> um, no, I mean, I have an Instagram and a YouTube channel, but 
follow me, don't follow me. I don't really care. I'm not so much. Uh, I, I just like making memes and making content whenever I can. So if you need speed coaching though, then message me. Absolutely follow me for that. Do you have the bandwidth for that right now? Probably not, but you know, I'm gonna still save regardless. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, reach out and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I'll leave your links below. Um, yeah, thank you again. It was so amazing to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, I would love to hear your discussion and thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. If you're listening through a podcasting platform, I'd appreciate if you rate it five stars and you can continue the discussion through my competition climbing discord um, linked in all of the descriptions through all the platforms. Thanks again for listening.